Welcome to the September 13, 2023 regular meeting of the Washington Healthcare District Board of Directors. I'd invite you all to stand and join me in a prayer, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, as well as the liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Yes. Director Stewart. Present. Director Nicholson. Present. Director Wallace. Present. Director Yee. Present. Director E. Penn. Present. Thank you. Cheryl. You're welcome. Public notice for this meeting has been posted appropriately on our website. Tonight's meeting is in person in the boardroom at 2000 Mallory Avenue. It is also accessible by Zoom. Ask that you mute your systems until such time as you need to speak. We are recording tonight's regular session and the book will be posted on our website for future viewing. We move first to communications. Uh, oral communications. So members of the public are invited to speak during oral communications. When prompted, please state your name for the record, then proceed with not to exceed three minutes on issues or concerns not on the agenda and within the subject matter of jurisdiction of the board. I have speaker cards from, for two people. At this point, I'd invite uh, Bits to come and speak to us. I think I've got well, this is the, um, there's these two, the second group. Ah, okay. Uh, That's sorry. the second group. Mm -hmm. I don't know which. Yeah, Adam and Jonathan. Okay, how about Jonathan? Adam will go first. So we'll first hear from Adam. Hello, people. We're all here together. I'm just trying to get some situated, right? We're all in the National Hospital or the National Hospital crew. So, um, first thing is, okay, I've been thinking about this for a couple of weeks or so, but I kind of came to the conclusion that, okay, I tell you about this. We've been, I haven't been a couple of meetings, but we've been heading back and forth and to get what they want, right? Fine. Okay, I started thinking about that. Thanks for him. Long strike, we go. Okay, so I figured out, I said, if they do go on strike, that means people that's driving up and want to come to the hospital, they're going to get scared. They're going to say, oh, wow, no, there's a strike. Oh, yes. What they do, they go right around the corner, go up to Kaiser, and Kaiser's going to say, yeah, come on in. We're fine. The thing is, okay, the thing is, one person, you lose. I hear we're at a meeting every three years, but that one person you're going to do, I mean, he's going to Kaiser, he's going to stay with Kaiser, the husband's going to stay with Kaiser, and the generation's going to go with Kaiser. So how much money are we really going to lose for every one person that never wants to come back here? Because they say, well, they don't got their stuff together over there. So why should we go over there? Right? Well, in the long run, I think. I don't know if you're going to be right or wrong. In the long run, are we going to use more customers just because we can't do the stuff in out here? Yeah. That's the way I think. So if you add up how, many, how much money per generation per one person, how do bit that you lose 100 people within this time? If the Right. Add it up, add it. It's simple math. How many times, how many times for period of them and then their husband and then they tell their kids, generation. How much did we lose because we couldn't get the How much did we lose? How much did we gain? Oh yeah, we gained a little bit here. Fine. Yes, that's a long thirty second. Small turn thing. So that was my main thing. And the other thing, my last thing is I've been watching the news and everything. There's five companies that went on strike, they all settled for the same amount. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. We're now ready for Jonathan. Hello, board. My name is Jonathan Burdick, and I'm from the respiratory department. And I'd like to let you know that last week at Washington Hospital, a EBS worker cleaned a room. Last week at Washington Hospital, a member from Still Processing sterilized and, and cleaned instruments for surgery. An ORA tech took inventory for the day to make sure that they would have all the tools that, 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 that they would need for their procedures. And although this may seem routine and in insignificant, I can assure you that there is no such thing as a small action at Washington Hospital. Every mechanic matters. And it matters because last week at Washington Hospital, a nurse picked up the phone, called the doctor, and said, Doctor, we are no longer able to detect a fetal heart rate on the monitor. And because EVS had cleaned the room, that mom was able to go straight to the, to the OR without delay because sterile processing had sterilized all of the, the tools. The OR tech was able to pre prepare for an emergent C-section. And when that baby was delivered without a heart rate, my coworker Heather and I were able to administer life-saving care and we got that, 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 that heart rate back in, in less than, than one minute. But this outcome wasn't just because of my skills or Heather's skills. It was a collective effort by everyone who had did their job before we stepped into that room. At Washington Hospital, we are a team. And it is important that we acknowledge everyone as so. And so I'd like to take a, a moment to acknowledge everyone in, in this room, because no matter what chair you are, are, no matter what chair you're sitting in, you worked hard to get there. You've made sacrifices, and it has not been easy. But I also think it's important to remember that sometimes we overlook those who built the foundation that we stand on. Just yesterday, I was talking to a EVS worker who told me that she was only able to get half a tank of gas because she wanted to save the rest for her groceries. And this is un unacceptable. When a worker who has worked here for over 20 years has to, to choose between basic necessities, we need to do better. If we're going to continue to, func to function here as a team at Washington Hospital, then no one can be left behind. And we will not agree to any contract that, that doesn't move all of us forward together. I can promise you that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan and Adam. We appreciate your remarks. Thank you. We're at this point, because of the size of the room, we're going to switch groups. We have another group coming in with a couple of speakers there, so we're glad to have you here. But we need to switch uh, groups in and out. Thank this you. We'll uh, switch the next group in, and so you guys can just exit out the same way we came in, and then we'll uh, get the other group. We're probably going to have two more groups. Uh, a large number of people showed up at the last minute. They're very prompt.
So we, we welcome the second group in tonight. We appreciate you being here and anxious to hear from you. I have two speaker cards. I don't know whether you have a preference as to who speaks first. I have Vince and I have Ray. I'll go first. All right. I'm Vince. You're Vince? Yeah. Come on in, Vince. Come, on up, come on up here. Oh, please. sorry. <laughs> Say hi. There you go. My name is Vince Morano. I am a full-time transport TNA here at Washington Hospital. I've been working here for over four years now. Uh, I first, wa first want to start off about our issue um, with separating our department from the TNA title. Uh, we as a department feel like we are being mis misrepresented in the sense that we all want different titles from the floor CNAs, thus making us no longer being able to float to the many floors of this hospital. This would cause many problems in the department, the biggest one being that more than half the department would end up being canceled and out of work indefinitely. Mm -hmm. This is due to the fact of the proposed title change for our department, making it impossible for us to float to any other department aside from ourselves. We all want the best interest for our department, that being that everyone has an equal opportunity to work and get their income, whether it be within our department or in the other departments as well. We think of our department as more of a family rather than just a group of coworkers, and to see some of our work not being able to work due to a silly title change would be devastating. Um, secondly, uh, I want to talk about um, our wage increase, and we all as a group attending here before you guys think that the wage increase is not enough. As we all know, the state of inflation has driven prices of gas, food, and essential items up. Uh, another increase that is instrumental to all of us workers under the SEIU is the $200 proposed charge per paycheck just for our benefits. That equates to over $5,200 over a year to just pay for benefits. Many of us, this $5,200 would be just too much for us to handle. We think that 9.5% over the three years is lackluster, especially with the state of the economy. Our workers in the hospital aren't just workers. We see them as fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, and especially family to all of us. All we want in the end is for us to have a fair wage, in fair wage increase of at least 25% spread amongst three years. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Ray Navarro. Nice to meet you. I've been working here for four years in transport as a CNA. You know, I think the wage cut and things like that is a little disrespectful. We have been working here during the pandemic. Anyways, we've been working here through the whole entire pandemic. What has it been, four years? We deserve a raise. We deserve pay off for all the hard work we've all done. Everyone in this room, we've all done our part. You know, I just want to double down on what he said. I feel the same way. We all feel the same way. Everyone in these chairs outside over here. I just hope you can all have some sympathy. It's a little tough. Wages for a person who is single myself, I don't have a family yet. It's okay. But people who have multiple children, mortgages, things to pay like that, it's tough for them. I hope you keep that in mind when you're thinking about different prices of what we will get paid, what can be done, and for benefits as well. And that's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. 
we we appreciate your attendance. We appreciate uh, listening to Vince and both Ray. Uh, we have another group that needs to come in and join us in the meeting to speak. So uh, we'll invite you to leave and and give, make room for the next group. We appreciate you being here. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Come on in. We welcome you to come all the way all the way around here to these chairs in front. Invite you to come on forward. Yeah. Chairs up here. Yeah. Yeah. There's still still a number of open chairs all the way around here in front. If you want to over come here, in. please come. Come in. There's two more chairs. Shortcut. Yes, I did, didn't I? <laughs> we can, we can. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate you being here. We're anxious to hear from you. We have one speaker card, and uh, that's Regina. Hope I pronounced that right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Come, come on up here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is my second time to be up here, and I'm I'm not speaking for myself. And good you know, um, I forgot to say good afternoon to all the executive officers here. But uh, I was given 20 I mean two minutes before. Cheryl, can you give me more since I'm the only one? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm speaking to where. I mentioned what I mentioned before. It's the cost of living that we really are, you know, concerned. You know, we cannot afford. We try to live a simple life, but even simple is not. It's difficult for us. Mm -hmm. So, personally, I do simple life. I dye my own hair. I don't go to salon. I don't even know what mall looks like. <laughs> I go to the Berryessa Mall if you know where that is in San Jose because, you know, I can bargain there. But um, please listen to us. The Creator gave us this to have this. So I hope every one of you will, you know, again, um, be in our own shoes. We, we cannot afford, we cannot afford even a luxury life. You, you know, most of us, are driving a new car, but that new car is loaned for six years. So even this contract ended already, we even haven't paid off that car. So please, please listen to us. This is a community hospital and 
you know, we don't want to change those last letters to something else. There's unity on that end, so please. Mm -hmm. We are all family here. And as EBS, we try to clean this hospital mm -hmm. as much as we can. You know that. Mm -hmm. Every corner, every patient room, we try to do our best to clean it. And we don't want to go out there causing trouble. And we don't want to leave the patient room to be dirty or your offices. So I hope you listen to us. And the decision, we believe, is at your hands. You respected the executive officers. You have, have the power to do that. We believe in you. So, and right now we have five or six injured um, co-workers in our department alone, in our ship alone. So, wait, 30 seconds. Yeah, again, we ask for your whatever you can give us to, to make us survive, especially at this time. We don't want you giving us flowers when we're already late to rest, so please. <laughs> Give us that now, now that we are strong, now that we are healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Regina, we appreciate your remarks. We appreciate all of you being here this evening. We're having to transport people in and out. You've got such a nice big group. Uh, but uh, as far as uh, our oral communications were, that we're able, able now to move on to a different area of the agenda. So we'd invite you all to, to leave, or if you'd want to stay for the next three hours, we'll be glad. <laughs> At any rate, thank you all very much. Thank you. Carol, are there any uh, written communications? There are no written communications. I will uh, we'll now move to the consent calendar. I'm looking at I'm sorry, is there another group? No, I, I, I think he was just checking. I apologize. And coming back, was he, was he checking? Yeah. Want me to go check? Yeah. What? Thank you, Cheryl, for checking. I'm sure everyone has an opportunity to join with us if they need to. We will now move to our consent calendar. The consent calendar consists of those agenda items that the board will approve with one motion. Unless either a member of the board or a member of the public requests to remove an agenda item from the consent calendar. If any items are removed from the consent calendar, the board will take action on the removed agenda item later in the meeting under the action item heading of the agenda. Does anyone on the board want to remove an agenda item from the consent calendar? None. Does any member of the public want to remove an agenda item from the consent calendar? None. I have a motion now to approve the consent calendar items A through Y. Mr. President, I move that the Board of Directors approve consent calendar items A through Y. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Cheryl, if you take the roll on that, please. Uh, Director Stewart? Aye. Director Nicholson? Aye. Director Wallace? Aye. Director Yee? Aye. Director Epen. Aye. Good. The consent calendar passes. <laughs> That's a big. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> One more could have been the medical I've been busy. Yeah, been yes, busy. Yeah. Appreciate their work on. Yeah, yeah. Huge, yeah. huge. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of work. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, we now have several presentations to listen to and hear from. Kimberly, if you could introduce item A. Yes, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce item A. Um, we have Joanne Pineda here from the American Heart Association. Uh, she has been with the American Heart Association for over 10 years. She's the Quality Improvement Manager and looks after quality data and outcomes research. Uh, it's my pleasure because she will be presenting two awards this evening to Washington. Uh, these awards demonstrate the true collaboration and coordination among departments, staff, and physicians. Their efforts have saved lives, reduced suffering, and have always focused on the patient-first ethic. And I do want to just uh, notice that, that we do have a number of our medical director physicians that are, have joined us and also staff from, from various departments that have been involved in, in both our STEMI program and our stroke program. So. Thank you, Joanne, for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm going to share my screen, and can somebody just confirm that they can see it? Yep. Yeah. Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Joanne Pineda, and I'm a healthcare quality consultant with the American Heart Association. Um, it is my privilege to be here today to honor your achievements and celebrate with all of you. American Heart Association, American Stroke Association is pleased to present Washington Hospital Healthcare System these awards for outstanding quality stroke and STEMI care delivered by your hospitals to the citizens of Fremont. We congratulate all members of your clinical team and the magnificent work they do every day. Led by Dr. Rose, Dr. Kalsa, Maria Nunes, your stroke team continues to exceed the bar for stroke care since joining Get With The Guidelines in 2006. The Get With The Guidelines Stroke Award recognizes hospitals that treat 85% of eligible stroke patients according to the AHA's recommended guidelines for one year. The Target Stroke Honor Roll Award is presented to a very exclusive group of hospitals, both in California and nationally, that treat at least 75% of their stroke, acute stroke patients in 60 minutes or less providing the patient the opportunity to receive a clot-busting drug, which has been proven to improve outcomes for the stroke patient if given within a short period of time after symptom recognition. The target diabetes honor roll aims to ensure that every patient with type 2 diabetes receive the most up-to-date evidence-based care when hospitalized with stroke. I congratulate your hospital for achieving the 2023 Get With the Guidelines Stroke Gold Plus Target Stroke Elite Honor Roll, and Target Type 2 Diabetes Honor Roll. Additionally, I'm excited for Dr. Lin and the STEMI team this year. Like the Stroke Award criteria, the Get With the Guidelines Coronary Artery Disease Mission Lifeline Award recognizes hospitals that treat 85% of eligible STEMI patients according to the AHA's recommended guidelines for one year. I commend your hospital for commit for your commitment in achieving the 2023 Mission Lifeline STEMI Receiving Gold Award. Adherence to both stroke and STEMI evidence-based guidelines saves lives and improves patient outcomes. Get With the Guidelines emphasizes a multidisciplinary approach to patient care. In addition to Dr. Rose, Dr. Kalsa, Maria, Dr. Lin, I'd like to thank, thank you to say thank you to all of the members your hospital leadership team, Kimberly Hartz, Larry Labossier, Terry Hunter, other key leaders, Michael Platzbecker, Alvin Aguirre, Betty Goodwin, Lisa Villanueva, and of course, the neurologists, interventionalists, cardiologists, the RNs, the emergency department physicians and RNs, cath lab department, critical care services, rehab services, radiology, the list goes on for their hard work and dedication to improving the quality of care for your patients. I'd also like to recognize uh, your EMS colleagues as they are a, are a key in this heart and in the stroke and heart attack system of care and their pre-notification is a critical factor in achieving good patient outcomes and ultimately recognition. As in prior years, the American Heart Association will celebrate your hospital 
and all silver and gold winning, award-winning hospitals nationally with a local and national recognition by the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, with a listing on our website and inclusion in the healthcare edition of US News and World Report, as well as recognition at our annual conferences, uh, cardiology scientific sessions, and international stroke conference. It is my pleasure to present these awards to Washington Hospital for your outstanding commitment and dedication to, to quality stroke and cardiovascular care. Thank you so much for all the work that you do to save lives and improve patient outcomes for the patients and families you are privileged to serve in your community. Congratulations. It's a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Of course, it makes, makes us all feel good. And uh, by the time you get through thanking everybody, it's obvious it's a very important team effort. Uh, all people involved in that will thank them. It's a great privilege to have those awards. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Joanne, and to the team. Yes. Good. Now we can move to item B. All right. Uh, item B is the... Uh, 2023 Don Pickenpaw Scholarship Award. I just want to say a few things about uh, Don Pickenpaw, and then Shirley Ehrlich is going to talk a little bit more about our awardee. So, uh, Ms. Mr. Pickenpaw was a board member of the Washington Hospital Healthcare District Board of Directors. Uh, he was first elected to the board in 1976. He was elected uh, president five times during his 27 year tenure, most recently in 2002. During his time on the board, Mr. Pickenpaw provided leadership on many projects, but most notable is his work on the acquisition of Washington West in 1997 and the renovation of the hospital's sixth floor in 2002. This renovation added more than 29 beds to the hospital's capacity. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Pickenpaw passed away in February of 2003. Uh, so, WIA's scholarship was established in 2002 and was renamed in honor of Don Pickenpaw in 2008. The criteria is that the student be a dependent of a Washington Hospital employee, a graduating senior, community college student, transferring community college student, or a student attending a four-year institution on at least a half-time basis. Uh, we also had a wonderful panel of judges that I want to thank uh, for the 2023. Uh, scholarship Award. They were Elisa Curry, John Lee, Dr. Russell North, Dr. John Romano, and Dr. William Wood. <laughs> so thank, thank you to all the judges that participated. And now uh, Shirley Ehrlich is going to talk a little bit about our awardee. awardee. Many of you know Shirley, uh, but she is acting as, our, as uh, the president of the Washington Hospital Employees Association, known as WIA. She has worked at Washington for 13 years and as an executive assistant, she started in health information management, medical records, and was in the medical staff for a short period of time before coming to the administration department. Uh, she served as president of WIA in 2011 to 2013 and returned as president in January of 2019. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce our 2023 Don Pickenpaw Scholarship Awardee. Her name is Melinda Jane Pagoa. She goes by MJ. She's the daughter of two healthcare professionals. Her father, Robert Pagoa, is a senior clinical laboratory scientist at Washington Hospital, while her mother works as a dental assistant. They both have influenced her into the medical field due to their strong passion for patient care. She's currently enrolled at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, majoring in microbiology, hoping to become a clinical laboratory scientist. Beyond academics, she finds joy in singing, photography, and playing lacrosse. And she's incredibly honored to have received the Wea Don Pickenpaw Memorial Scholarship Award. Is there anything you'd like to say, Melinda? Yes. Good evening, everyone. I would like to give a huge thank you to everyone who was able to support me and um, allow me to have this scholarship. And I will use it wisely and I will use it so that I could become a future healthcare worker. Thank you so much. Thank you. Again, Thanks. congratulations. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's always a joy to see uh, young people headed in uh, such strong, good directions. 
and a greater joy when they come back and work here. Especially yeah. in the lab. That's right. wonderful. Future lab employee. Yeah. I, we'll I see hope, you soon. Yeah, I hope you heard that from the director. <laughs> she, she said, it's a special joy to see you come back. <laughs> anyway, thank you very, very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Now to item C. All right. Uh, next, uh, we have Kayla Gupta, who is our community outreach manager, and she is going to be talking about all the work that Washington uh, does in the community. Uh, Kayla has been with Washington Hospital Healthcare System since 2022. As our community outreach manager, Kayla is responsible for health and wellness programming and the Washington Wellness Center. Before joining Washington, she worked with Sutter Health as a community benefit coordinator. In this role, Kayla managed the Community Health Needs Assessment and Grant-Making Program in San Mateo and Santa Cruz counties. She earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Pennsylvania and master's degree in public health from Emory University. Kayla is married with one young son. And also Tina Nunes, our Vice President of Ambulatory Care Services, will provide a few opening remarks um, before the presentation begins. Great. Thank you, Kimberly. Yeah. I'm very happy this evening that Kayla's been invited tonight to speak about our community outreach program. Usually when we think about hospitals, um, we think about what comes to mind is either the inpatient work, the operating room, the nursing units, also on the outpatient side, lab and imaging. But a crucial component of the mission of this district is to meet the healthcare needs of the district residents through education. We do this by, um, essentially, as our mission states, we do this by providing resources to enhance patient care and health promotion through the district. Tonight's presentation will demonstrate our commitment is to this aspect of the mission by describing our outreach work to the community. Our aim is to arm residents with reliable, evidence-based information about maintaining their health or adopting lifestyle choices that will improve their health. The focus this, with this work is to educate our residents about how to prevent illness, stay healthy, and recognize the warning signs that should be checked out by a healthcare professional. Kayla will provide an overview of the events we participate, including health fairs across the district, as well as taking education to where the, to where the district residents live. The presentation today is not everything we do, but it's a snapshot just to give an overview of the community outreach, outreach we do provide to our district residents. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kayla. All right. Thank you so much for that introduction, Tina. Um, I'm so proud to be here today to present to you all about the work that we do to get Washington Hospital out into the community. So we can move on to the next slide to talk a little bit about an overview of what I'll present to you all today. So we'll talk about our community health education, our health and wellness seminars, the work that goes on in our wellness centers, our health insurance information services, as well as our nonprofit relations. And as Tina mentioned in the introduction, what I'm sharing today is really just a snapshot of all of the community programs that the hospital engages with. Um, so some additional activities won't be included today, but we'll do our best to give you a nice overview of the work that's going on out in the community. If we move on to the next slide, I can give you a nice snapshot of our small but mighty team of five. And this is just to help give you some faces to put to our division. Um, you can see that our team is led by Angus um, here at the top when he's not out vacationing. Um, we also have uh, Evangeline, who helps oversee our volunteer services department. Christy, who provides direct insurance service, services to our district residents. Um, myself in the role where I oversee our wellness center and community programming. And the final member of our team is Kathy. Um, she's our wellness concierge. She always greets our massage and fitness clients with a big smile and a, a great attitude. And moving forward, um, we can get an idea of, you know, even though we're a small team, we do have a wide area of focus that we work on. And Throughout this uh, presentation, I'll be diving into more detail about many of these areas of focus. So this is just a quick a view from the top. Um, so we do have our health insurance information services where we meet one-on-one -on -one with district residents to connect them to Medicare, to help them understand how to find a doctor, navigate our healthcare system. We have our volunteer services, which is a very strong team of over 500 volunteers. Our wellness center, which offers great fitness classes and massage therapy. Community Outreach, which I'll show you in just a few moments, 
how we're getting out in our health fairs and fairs across the district, our sponsorships where we help support our nonprofit organizations, the community health needs assessment, which I was um, honored to speak with you all about a couple of months ago, that gives us that nice big overview of the health of the overall district. And because our district covers such a large geographic region, we have a strong role in government relations where, you know, it's really crucial that we keep in touch with our elected officials that represent all of the jurisdictions that overlap with our healthcare district. So for government relations, we have regular communications with three mayors, three city councils, two assembly members, two county supervisors, one state senator, and two members of Congress. And so we're always closely tracking state legislation that's introduced in Sacramento that may have implications for the healthcare system and the district. And from time to time, we will advocate for or against individual bills. But the next thing I'd like to look at is just to give you an in-depth um, view into the ways that we connect with our district residents throughout the year. And so I've broken this down into the different quarters um, of the last fiscal year. Our health fairs and our fairs are just one of the key ways that we make sure that we take our education and our presentations to as many different parts of the district that we can. We understand that not everyone's going to be able to come and take the trip down to downtown Fremont. And so in the interest of equity, we make sure that we bring our health education out into the community and serve them where they are. A lot of this work is seasonal work. Um, it's based around when many of our partners and our city partners, nonprofit partners are hosting their fairs and their community events. And so in this slide here, you can see, you know, how busy we are in the summer and the early uh, fall time frame. I'll highlight just a few as we go through the next two slides. But many of our events are very culturally specific. So, for example, like our Newark Mariachi in the Park or our Festival of India. And we really do our best to make sure that we don't leave out any ethnic or cultural groups. Um, in addition, that the cities, you know, Fremont, Newark, Union City are really great community partners for us. And so we work very closely and attend many of the events that they host. If we move forward into the October, December um, slide, you can see that last fall, um, I'll just highlight a few events here. Last fall, we were able to work with the county on a program called Science in the Park. And this was a favorite project of the late supervisor, Richard Valle. And our hope is that we'll be able to continue seeing this program and, and partner with this program as Supervisor Marquez um, takes over in that role. And we're always on the lookout for new community partners. If we can go back one, one moment, I just wanted to, to note our uh, participation in the Arune Foundation walk. So this was a new partner of ours last year. Um, unfortunately, the Arune family had lost their child in a drowning accident, um, but they were able to you know, set up a foundation and really help spread education about sneaker waves and provide these life-saving rings at local beaches. And we wanted to do our best to partner with them and share their message and their education. And so we were able to attend their walkathon. Um, we helped co-present a health and wellness seminar on beach safety, beach and water safety with them. And this is just an example how we partner with our um, district nonprofits and organizations to really turn something that's a tragedy and, and make something good of it. And we can move on um, to the next slide, thank you. So in January through March, this is just another example of the way that we partner with our cities. Uh, City of Fremont had a, a really fun Lunar New Year event there that we were a part of. And looking at the spring, um, you know, one thing I'd like to highlight is our work. You know, we were able to go out to the Emergency Preparedness Fair at the LDS Temple. And it's really great to see how the hospital makes sure to engage with faith communities as well in the district. And later on in October, we're also going to be um, attending the Parish Festival at Our Lady of the Rosary in Union City. And that's something we're excited to be a part of and to branch into that community some more. The other event listed here, last on the list is New Haven Days. And this is just another way to highlight the work that we do with our school districts across the Tri-City. That's always a type of partnership that we're looking to build and grow on some more. So in the past fiscal year, we were able to do 19 health fairs and do free blood pressure checks and health education um, for 612 residents. We're very proud of that number. And I have a little snapshot showing what's coming ahead in the next couple of months. So as you can see, Poly Step Out just happened last week. This is a really wonderful senior health fair um, with Union City's Rajiri Senior Center. We were able to have some nurses out there doing blood pressure checks. Our health insurance information coordinator, Christy, gave out a lot of information about 
connecting to Medicare enrollment. Um, and you'll see that a lot of these events can probably look familiar to you because I know that the board has been kind enough to participate in things like New York Days. I and mean, it's always wonderful when we see you get out into the community. And so I just want to make sure to thank you all for attending these events and also for being part of our Fremont Summer Concert Series earlier in this season. Uh, the last event in September that we have is the HERS Walk, Run, Yoga. And I just want to highlight that because we have a few staff that are board members with HERS, and it's just a natural connection with our oncology team, especially since HERS is housed in Washington West, so they're very near and dear, dear to us. Moving forward, we can see October is quite a busy month, especially the first half of October. Um, we have a lot of events that are coming up on the horizon. But the one that I would like to just draw your attention to is Think Pink, which is coming up on October 19th. And this is a celebration for our breast cancer survivors. It's a way for them to meet up, um, celebrate their resilience, connect with friends, old and new. And for this event, community relations, um, community outreach is in charge of, you know, the logistics and helping put this event together. This year, we're bringing back our photo booth. Something new we're doing is offering henna for our guests. Um, as well as having a fun button activity where people can make breast cancer survivor buttons to showcase their survivorship. Um, in addition to our speakers and our activities at that uh, Think Tank event, we also have a health fair that showcases over 20 different exhibitors that share information about cancer resources for our patients. We're really lucky to have such great partners in oncology and the Women's Center to make sure that we have engaging speakers and, and topics for our patients. It's something that they really look forward to each year and that we're very proud to be a part of. That being said, um, I wanna just mention that none of our outreach, part, outreach work would be possible without the great partners that we have across our hospital, without the great work that happens through our community, through our communications and marketing team, our patient care services staff and WTMF. So this is just, you know, a snapshot of everyone that I'd like to say thank you to um, for their great work getting out there in the community and connecting us. In addition to the work at our health fairs, we also do a variety of speaking engagements. And if we move to the next slide, you'll be able to see that it's called our Speakers Bureau. Uh, and so this is when we go out and do more um, personalized, in-person, uh, on-site presentations. Many of the partners that we work with here are through senior living communities. Some of them are school districts. So, for example, last year we had Dr. Sagal and Wajia Khan go out to Ardenwood Elementary School and present on youth mental health for Mental Health Awareness Month. We also do presentations on sports safety with our youth sports organizations like Fremont Football and Cheer and the Newark Little League. And last fiscal year, we were able to do 28 of these presentations, which reached over 750 individuals. In addition to these sorts of events, we also have ongoing community programs that I'd just like to walk through each of these quickly. We have our tattoo removal program, which is a program to help district residents really get their life back on track after they leave gangs or they're recovering from substance use disorders. It helps them start over and erase painful past experiences. Um, and, you know, we've been honored to help remove tattoos for victims of human trafficking, um, to help get their life back on track and, and really make a difference to allow them to move forward. Our community mammogram program is a program that's funded with Measure A money from the county. Um, this is a program that allows us to offer important preventative screenings to patients without any insurance coverage at no cost to the patient. We have our lymphedema garment program, which allows low-income residents to get access to medically necessary garments at no cost. And we have a durable medical equipment program, which works with our partner ReCares Network that allows individuals to get durable medical equipment like walkers or shower chairs um, that they may need that they might not be able to afford on their own. Another program that we offer is our skin cancer screening event. And this is in partnership with Dr. Sunil Duan. And last year, we were able to screen around 40 patients for skin cancers, um, and we did find several malignant growths that were treated out of those free screenings for our community members. So this is really important life-saving work. The last item on this list is our uh, City of Fremont partnership on the mobile evaluation team. And so Washington Hospital helps provide a social worker as part of this team, which is also made up of a homeless outreach worker and a police officer. 
And they go out into the field responding to individuals in behavioral health crisis. Many times um, that's often in our homeless population as well. So those are important ways we're getting out there, but we're always looking at developing new programs. And if we move to the next slide, you can see we have a couple items that are still in the very early stages of development, um, but I do just wanna draw our attention to our work on a naloxone administration education program um, because this is something that's very timely. I know just last week we heard that there were five overdoses and two deaths in Union City and South Hayward. Um, and so these are projects that are very important to us that are um, you know, in the very early stages and we'll be sure to keep the board updated as we move these forward and develop them further. Washington Hospital also, you know, we want to make sure that we're a thought leader in South County in providing healthcare resources. And one way that we do that is by hosting a variety of special events. We're able to convene experts to talk about health needs and social trends that are impacting the people that live in our district. Last year, we held a wonderful community forum on anti-Asian hate that really brought together nationally recognized experts on the topic, as well as our own psychiatrist, Dr. Sina Sagal. And it really shed light on social determinants of health and, you know, the, um, the violence that our Asian community is facing post-pandemic. It's also a natural fit for us to bring together our patients, um, especially those who may have benefited from our care, particularly in our oncology department. And so by hosting our events like our Think Pink Breast Cancer Awareness event and our Celebration of Life, which celebrates all cancer survivors, not just those who are breast cancer survivors, are ways that we bring those communities together. I have a few other special events I'd like to share with you as well on the next slide. And one of those is something that was brand new this year, and that was our Road to Wellness Family Health Care event. And this was something that um, we had a lot of fun with. We were able to have over 35 informational booths from our nonprofits and our departments, um, our doctors and staff, um, doing blood pressure checks, we were able to do over 75 blood pressure checks, over 130 glucose and cholesterol checks with our wonderful lab team. We had fun performances from our community groups like the Bay Philharmonic Youth Orchestra and Music for Minors. And in addition to um, having really great information, we were able to bring 15 different vehicles on site, like garbage trucks and sewer trucks, to teach um, you know, community, the ways that those can impact your health and get an up close view on some fun trucks as well. So it was a way to, to spread awareness, but also have a little bit of fun. Um, so I was really uh, excited to have that new event for us all this year at the hospital. You know, these are just examples of ways that we stay relevant, we stay connected to all of our community members across the district. And so um, most of these events that I have listed here were from last fiscal year. We had a couple in the current fiscal year, but um, we're seeing about, you know, over 3,000 attendees between the six that I've listed out for you, for you here tonight. We also offer a lot of uh, health education through our health and wellness seminars. And one thing that we've discovered in the pandemic is that there's a huge demand for health and wellness education. And we responded to this by offering online on-demand classes. So our health and wellness seminars are very strong collaboration with our marketing and communications team. They make sure to to send out a beautifully designed health and wellness catalog to every house, household in the district twice a year. We have presentations that um, stream twice per month, both on YouTube and Facebook. And while we haven't gone back to in-person events solely, we are starting to do some hybrid events, which happen about four times a year, to allow us to reach a larger audience, both in person and through YouTube and Facebook. Moving to the next slide, you can sort of see that the average viewership for these programs. We've offered health and wellness programming for many years, but now that we offer it online as well and on demand, our reach has really expanded. And so we're seeing an average viewership of about 740 total views for each of our seminars. In the last fiscal year, we were able to host 30 seminars, which got us over 21,000 views. The three that are listed here on our slide for intermittent fasting, hip replacement, and shoulder pain were our highest viewed. Um, seminars from the last fiscal year. And I'd like to shift and talk about our wellness center. So as you all heard in my presentation previously about our health needs assessment, diabetes and obesity is a key health need our, in our community. And so our wellness center is a pillar for wellness and prevention by offering affordable wellness classes to all of our community members. Um, you know, we offer 
Tai Chi, uh, cardio exercises, yoga, both um, with seated poses and traditional yoga that uses the floor. So we're really allowing people of all different abilities and ages to access classes that are affordable and, and fit their needs. And not only is it helping our individuals get physically fit, for many of the folks who attend our classes, many who are seniors, it really also plays an important role in their social interactions and their mental well-being. They have a community in their class, and they really look forward to seeing each other. Um, last fiscal year, we were able to offer over 270 classes for over 1,300 enrollees. It was very exciting. Another program from our wellness center, which is well-loved, is, of course, our massages. And Washington makes sure to take a holistic approach to our health. We understand that massage therapy can really help manage recovery and pain for a lot of patients. So we have therapists who are able to offer services in deep tissue, prenatal, and oncology massage. And because we, we recognize that massage can be such an important tool to relieve symptoms for our oncology patients, we will be offering certification training in oncology for all of our massage therapists in the new year, which is something that we're very excited about. Last fiscal year, we were able to give over 1,300 massages, and this is something that we hope to continue and grow um, over the coming year. I briefly talked about our Health Insurance Information Service Coordinator, Christy, before, um, and I just wanted to cover a little bit more about the work that she does. You know, in Alameda County, we're lucky that many of our residents have some form of insurance. But even if people have insurance, they're frequently confused about how do they navigate care, how do they understand their plan options, where do you find a doctor, and how do you read your medical bills? And that's where Christy really comes in to help move our community members through these challenges. Um, she's very busy during open enrollment season, which happens in October, and she's able to offer services both in person, on the phone, over Zoom, to make sure that she's reaching residents where it's easiest for them to connect. Last fiscal year, she was able to reach over 1,400 residents through her health insurance services. And the final topic I'd like to mention is our community engagement. Um, when I talk about our community engagement, is our affiliation with our local nonprofit community. And so, our hospital leadership provides technical expertise and strategic guidance to serve on the boards of local nonprofits. And here you can see all of the different organizations in the district where we have board representation and affiliation. Um, so we really, um, you know, pride ourselves in offering volunteer leadership to the community. Um, we're always in discussions with organizations to find additional opportunities where we can support them, um, you know, especially if they have missions that align with, with ours. And while we support many organizations financially, usually through sponsorships or fundraising, we also have helped some organizations when they need to find a physical location that they can afford to use for their space. And so as long as the groups have a mission that's aligned with ours, we're happy to donate that, you know, space on our campus. So we are proud to offer office space for SAVE, One Child, HERS Breast Cancer Foundation, and the Bay Area Women Against Rape. Um, in addition, you know, something that's really unique at Washington Hospital is that for the nonprofit ReCares, which is our durable medical equipment um, program, we're able to offer a large storage area in Washington West for them to hold those materials. And finally, the hospital also partners with our Boy Scouts of America to host our Medical Explorers Club here on campus. They offer a year-long course on the many different careers that are available in a healthcare setting. And for many years, the executive sponsor for that uh, Medical Explorers group has been our Chief of Compliance, Kristen Ferguson. So I just wanted to thank you all so much for taking the time. To, to hear my presentation this evening. I'm, you know, it's so great to be part of a community hospital that really does pride that connection with the residents that they serve. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Are there any questions? It appears not. Kayla, thank you very, very much. Wonderful. We see a variety of programs we have throughout the Tri-City area. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, it makes us very proud of the organization that does that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're now ready for item D, our construction. All right. Uh, we just uh, we have Ed Van, our executive vice president, that is going to give us a brief update on our um, patient bridge project. 
That's one of the uh, projects through the facility master plan. So he's going to share some slides and talk a little bit about where we are. Okay, um, Cheryl or... Uh, yeah, there you go. Okay. So the last time I uh, made this presentation to the board, we had just finished the two column. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can yeah, hear yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We just finished the two columns on the west side of the building and we're starting on the east. Now, <laughs> the east column, as you're going to see in this picture right here, was completed during the months of June and July. And so <clears throat> we're going to skip going through everything, basically everything that we went through on the west side in terms of, um, you know, pouring foundations, um, dropping down piers, uh, putting in concrete in those piers, and then building a slab on which the uh, column was uh, placed, column poured, and then a base uh, uh, placed on top of that column were completed. And you can see the that column, this is the east side column in this picture, in these two pictures as completed. And now this is just work around that column that are getting, that are getting uh, done. So I'll go quickly through it. This is just the sidewalk that had to be removed to get all that uh, concrete work and um, structural support in place. So it's being here uh, relayed out and then concrete poured. Next slide, please. That's the finished product of that uh, uh, sidewalk. What's con what's uh, significant about this is that this will become the new uh, employee entry uh, from the garage. Next slide, please. This is the driveway that is uh, for the loading dock. You might remember we had to... Um, remove this and it's got to have a different pitch on it to get under uh, the bridge when that's done. So this got uh, 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 um, redone uh, and actually there was structure for the column that also took place under the space. So this got uh, redone, resloped, and then concrete poured here. Next slide, please. That's the finished product. So you can see column, sidewalk, loading dock drive. Next slide, please. This is some work, uh, I'll just touch on this briefly, but basically the width of the bridge is was wider than our existing corridor that was leading into the operating rooms from the CJR. So we had to extend this corridor by um, uh, cutting the beam up above uh, putting on a, uh, a, a a connecting that beam if you look on the right hand uh, right hand side of this picture the right hand this the right half of this picture you can see a support beam tying into an existing beam up above and then a new column being placed to expand the width of this hallway to tie it to the to the uh, width of the bridge coming across ne next slide please. Okay, this gives you sort of a look at the first section of the bridge that is gonna go on the west side. And you can see that this work was done offsite and this section of the, of the bridge put together offsite. Next slide, please. Um, this is a pour that occurred. You might recall that for, for um, many, many months, actually better, better part of an e a year, the employee entrance was into the stairwell over by materials management. That got cut off as part of this. And now there has to be a new uh, exiting path um, for that um, emergency exit. It will no longer serve as an employee entryway, but it is still a fire emergency exit. And so this uh, sidewalk had to be poured and a step up that you don't see here yet um, so that people can safely exit uh, that staircase. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a concrete bore that's around uh, the column I was talking about that was added to the corridor outside of the CJR. Um, and so you can just see the, the base of that column uh, being um, uh, poured in concrete for, uh, you know, as part of the structure. Next slide, please. 
Okay, this shows you that section of the bridge being brought onto the um, campus via truck, and then it had to be, it was brought in on its side, then it had to be tipped up and then placed over on the two columns that are on the west end and uh, kind of uh, marry it up to that um, corridor coming out of the CJR. Next slide, please. Okay, you can see here the section of the bridge being swung into place. Uh, next slide, please. And then it gets placed on those two columns on the west side, and you can see there the structure coming out of uh, the CJR corridor. Next slide, please. Um, okay, and so here you get sort of a look at um, what the what this looks like as it gets fi uh, fitted into place and i think we i think that's either the last slide for this section or maybe there's one more yeah there you go um and so you can see that section now being put in place um and that and this basically ended our work for the month of august now we we did do work over the uh Labor Day weekend that uh, that was bringing in uh, the rest of the uh, of the steel cage for the for the bridge. And so I wanted to go quickly through those. Uh, next slide, please. So you can see this on campus. Um, this is back by the garage and uh, this section of the of the bridge uh, being dropped. And there's actually two sections. If you look beyond the one that's being tilted, there's a section behind that. They had to be put together and then uh, welded and uh, connected. Next slide, please. And here you can see that um, starting to take place. Next slide, please. That shows you the entire section after it was put together back on in the back uh the back drive back the, alongside the um, garage. Next slide, please. And then it had to be brought forward and brought into place um, um, over by the um, uh, CJR. You can see it. it's in a location now where it's going to be swung around 180 degrees to be put into place. Next slide, please. And there you have it. You have now the, the entire span uh, put in place, connections made. Um, the only thing that is is missing in terms of the final connection between both buildings is the cab. That will be um, the cab that moves um, with the center for, with the uh, Morris Hyman Critical Care Pavilion and that base isolation um, and the rest of the bridge is a structure that will stay in place, but on the east side, a cab will move back and forth with the building. So uh, we've got the span kind of in place now, and now they're working on putting on the flooring and putting on the roof. That, that work is already completed on the west side, that smaller west side section. You can see it's a little darker there. Roofs on, floors on, pores have started of concrete of both those things. And I think that's the last slide I had. I'll take any questions. Oh, I'll bet it was Happening. exciting when they put that down to make sure it fit. <laughs> <laughs> and it did fit perfectly. So I think the good thing for the for the board in terms of giving you an update is that um, you know, we're out of the ground and we're out of the really the risk areas where we weren't, you know, we there, there were things that we could run into that we were concerned about. We, we uh, accounted for all that. Um, and we have also projected all of our change orders moving forward. And I, I think you might remember when we started this, I said we have a very limited contingency on here. And as we're as where we are today and we expect to be done uh, the December, January timeframe, we are f uh, still projecting that we're going to be within our budgets and, you know, hitting our time frames with, you know, a completion time frame within 30 days of our original estimation. Thank you very much, Ed. That's always exciting to see the construction projects, especially mm -hmm. one as complicated as that. Any mm -hmm. questions from the board? Thank you again, okay. Ed. We appreciate that very, very much. Thank you. We're now 
for now at a point where we can move on to our reports. Uh, we have Dr. Soleil with us, our chief medical chief of Me chief medical staff here at the hospital. Dr. Soleil, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. This was perfect timing. I just came out of a three-hour leadership uh, training in conflict resolution. It's going to be the first of many, and it ended just in time. And I was waiting for that text message. I and I'm like, oh, I could show up in person. It's perfect. <laughs> um, so that's great. So that is one of the announcements, actually, that we're having these meetings. Um, this was the first one uh, with uh, a really good leader. She is experienced, and she's a lawyer and a PhD with... Um, been doing this kind of conflict resolution training for lawyers, doctors for, for many, many years. Um, and she's going to be spearheading this program. This one was in person. We're going to have several more over the next few weeks and months, actually, for the various leaders who are existing, currently in the leadership position or are up and coming. Um, and the rest will be probably in Zoom uh, fashion so that accommodate people's schedules. That's particularly exciting, I think, for the up and coming. Leaders. Yeah, it was great to see a good turnout tonight, actually. Yeah. Yeah. We participated. We had some didactic sections and then wow. some role-playing. That was, that was interesting. And Powerful. She set up some scenarios, and we had to be either arbitrator or a mediator and know the difference between the two positions and things like that. So, great. Really good. Um, we had the general medical staff meeting yesterday. It was my first one of one of those, and uh, I think it went okay from what I've heard. Um, we did the usual uh, medical staff business, and uh, one of the things we did was a trauma update, and we had uh, Dr. Chet Morrison, the new medical uh, director for the trauma. He was actually there as, as part of the meeting and introduced to everybody, and people had an opportunity to ask questions. So I thought that was good. The medical staff census, uh, the total is 605 medical staff, and there's 341 active staff as part of that. And then the final thing would be the acquisition privileges. Um, so I'm going to announce that they were approved at the uh, uh, Credentials Committee yesterday. We had a special MEC meeting today that approved it. And it is now um, here for the board. To it's already done. And oh, <laughs> all right. I don't have to do any convincing. No, you don't have to. <laughs> well, there you yeah. go. Find them up. We just need, we just need you to <laughs> be in the operating room and we get busy. Good stuff. <laughs> well, I think the um, the rep was just texting me and wanted to hear the final approval from yep. tonight, and we'll get the ball rolling. I know okay. I have a lot of patience. Yes. Um, uh, we'll see. I'm not sure exactly when we'll be able to do it because we have to get some approval from the insurance companies. Mm -hmm. But hopefully in the next week or two, maybe get our first couple of cases in. Great. Thank you for expediting that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank yeah. you guys thank for all your you help. Guys. I thank appreciate you. everybody's uh, uh, contribution to this. It's a very exciting move mm -hmm. in, the, yeah. in that area. Thank you. Um, that's all I have. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate all you're doing there. Now ready for the service league report, uh, Sheila. Oh, good Welcome. evening, everyone. <laughs> Members of the di district board, greetings from all the volunteers. Um, as is customary, our volunteers have maintained their commitment over the past month. During the month of August, a total of 2,494 hours were devoted to by 224 service league volunteers to support the hospital's endeavors. Um, last month, I spoke about my experience shadowing our WOF volunteer, Bentley, the lab reborn. Uh, this month, I'm proud to bring to your attention our Cuddler volunteer program, which is designed <laughs> to equip volunteers with the skills to engage with babies in special care nursery. Um, scientific studies have affirmed the profound effect of human touch given by cuddlers on a baby's social, emotional, and physical development. This physical connection fosters trust, mitigates uh, stress, helps in weight gain, and aids in their journey towards improved health. Although our nurses would cherish the opportunity to cuddle our little patients all day, our cuddlers enable them to fulfill their numerous other duties while still ensuring that the babies receive human touch when families are unavailable. Our cuddlers undergo a rigorous 
selection process, which includes an interview, background evaluations, along with thorough training and orientation covering essential topics such as patient privacy regulations, infection control procedures, and impl implementation of safety measures. I spoke to Susan Monticelli, a longtime volunteer cuddler, who says, in 2007, I began volunteering at Washington Hospital with a particular passion for working with babies, especially since my first child was born here. My initial role involved newborn photography, where I collaborated with another volunteer to capture precious moments for parents in a time when cell phones were less common. This role allowed me to interact with both babies and their families. Subsequently, I transitioned into the role of a cuddler at the hospital special care nursery. What could be better and usually more relaxing than rocking and comforting a newborn when the parents are not able to be there? Babies know when they are being held and often quiet down immediately. I must admit that I often feel as though I'm getting as much or more out of the quiet time I spend with these babies as they do. I remain committed and cherish my time cuddling these little ones, empathizing with the emotions faced by the families due to my own personal experience with a prematurely born child. I know what a stressful, emotional, and even guilt-ridden time it was for our family and I very much relate to what these families are going through. I hope to continue, she says, cuddling for another 16 years. <laughs> I don't know how she picked up that random number, but 16 years we got her, she says. Our cuddler program currently has 10 active volunteers with an additional two volunteers in the training process. This exceptional group not only maintains a regular schedule, but also remains on call day and night to provide care to all these babies. That's the end of my presentation. Please let me know if you have any questions. Any questions from the board? We appreciate, we appreciate that report. It's really nice to hear about the cuddlers. Yes, and um, Jeannie is smiling from year to year because we are part of that team and we love what we do. I was interested that they're on, on call into the evenings. Mm -hmm. Yes, sometimes we could potentially receive phone calls to hold babies through the night, and some of us have done it. Yeah, I've, I haven't cuddled here at the hospital, but I've spent <laughs> many late nights cuddling <laughs> our own. <laughs> it would be nice to have a relief on that. <laughs> These are the NAS babies, the babies that are born addicted to narcotics. Wow. And often moms are not in the picture and yes. they have found um, through many studies that these babies that are held um, can forego getting narcotic to really? withdraw. And yes. they have a much better outcome cognitively, emotionally, behaviorally, if we can give them that good start. Yes. And so... As, we're, so we're, it's, it's, yes, it's as much fun, but sometimes um, heartbreaking and difficult for the cuddlers, but we... That's why it's a special group, uh, Dr. Stewart and the board, that we are able to go in and provide that to the families and the little, little ones. Mm -hmm. Sheila had mentioned that the, um, the process to become a cuddler is a little bit more rigorous. We require that the volunteers that come, they prove that they really want to be here by volunteering actively for five months and giving at least 50 hours. Um, that way they know that volunteering here is really what they want to do. And after they complete that, then they go through an interview process and uh, the background screening through, F, you know, DOJ and, and all that. Mm -hmm. And so we do invest a lot in the cuddlers, but we expect a lot, too. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie, Good. for adding that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, Sheila, thank you very much for your report. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. We're ready now to move on to item C, our quality report. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce someone I know we all know, Dr. Diane Martin, and she's going to give her annual report on influenza, COVID, and RSD. Uh, just going to do a little bit of an introduction. Dr. Diane Martin has been a member of Washington Hospital's medical staff since 1984. 
She has served in many leadership roles at Washington, including chair of the Department of Medicine and chair of the Clinical Evaluation Committee, which includes pharmacy, therapeutics, and infection prevention. Dr. Martin has been a physician champion for a 5 million lives campaign, where she analyzed data and educated her peers on infection prevention issues, and specifically MRSA. Dr. Martin is currently the co-chair with Lena Wong for the Antimicrobial uh, Stewardship Committee and co-chair with Gulnaz Hanif for the Infection uh, Control Committee. Dr. Martin also served as one of our key leaders uh, during the peak of COVID response planning, a role she continues today. Uh, Dr. Martin attended medical school in Charleston, South Carolina, after which she completed her internship and residency at the University of Kentucky School of Medicine. She received a fellowship in infectious disease at the UC Davis School of Medicine, and she is also a member of Washington Township Medical Foundation. I also just want to take a moment uh, to take this opportunity to personally very much thank Dr. Martin for all that she has done for the patients and the healthcare system. Uh, she will be retiring from clinical practice at the end of this month, but she's still going to be working as a consultant with us in both infection con uh, control and antimicrobial stewardship. But to say that uh, Dr. Martin has made a difference for this, for our patients and for our community is truly an understatement because she has been integral in everything we've done in terms of infection prevention and uh, COVID response and all the other antimicrobial stewardship pieces that she has done. And just, I know she has many, many patients throughout the healthcare system and throughout the healthcare district. So thank you very much uh, thank you. for all of you that you have done. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So uh, it's my pleasure to talk about uh, the influenza COVID and RSV updates. And I can get Sharita to drive the slides, please. Or Cheryl, okay. All right, next slide. So we're talking on an update on our 2023 and 2024 influenza COVID and RSV uh, season. Uh, we're currently calling that a triple demic of influenza, COVID-19, and respiratory syncytial virus. And I'll go into these in a little more detail. Um, the influenza season has um, been a little more intense uh, due to relaxed measures. Uh, we were very slow in this area because of the masking and the COVID uh, brought on in the last couple of years. And we're becoming less intense with masks now and allowing a little more gatherings. And we're starting to see recirculation of most of these viruses again. Vaccinations are available and we strongly encourage people to take advantage of this. And it's covered almost always by insurance and the COVID are covered by federal government RSVP for many of the insurances. Uh, next slide. Talking about background for influenza, COVID-19, and RSV, these are very contagious respiratory viruses, and they are each different viruses. The COVID-19 is a coronavirus um, that is caused by uh, infection with respiration, um, and the flu is uh, influenza, and the respiratory syncytial virus is RSV. All three viruses have varying degrees of signs and symptoms, from anywhere to asymptomatic uh, to fairly severe and frequently hospitalized. Uh, we unfortunately have seen a lot of very asymptomatic transmission just in the last few months with surges, people gathering, getting uh, back to what they feel is their usual activity level, um, and unfortunately coming down with COVID. I think because most people have been vaccinated or because of the change in the strains. It's not been as severe as we saw probably three years ago, but we still get very concerned about that with our immunocompromised patients, patients with asthma, patients with COPD, patients with diabetes, dialysis patients, cancer patients. Many of our immunocompromised patients become very acutely ill. Very commonly, the symptoms we most frequently see are just a fever, which can be low, grade, or high. 
a cough, which can be dry or even productive, uh, sometimes shortness of breath, which can cause some difficulty breathing and more fatigue or tiredness, um, sore throat, runny nose, m- muscle aches, um, headaches, and for some people, vomiting and diarrhea, although this is much more common um, in children. So you can see there's sometimes a fairly wide spectrum of symptoms, and it's very interesting. I had one gentleman who called and said, oh, I just have a cold, but it's been going on a couple of days. I said, did you do a COVID test? Oh, no, I don't need that. I said, please do a COVID test. He called back an hour later. It's positive. So it can be very subtle, and we have to be alert to this. So respiratory viruses are spread mostly by droplets. And many of you have probably seen the backlight of a sneeze when it's a cough or a sneeze and the droplets kind of scattered. And depending on that, they can be airborne and very widely transmissible. And especially when somebody who has an infection doesn't cover their mouth or use tissue, then they're going to spread this virus on to other people. It can also be by touching. So if you're touching your face and then touching something else, a countertop, a cup, or something else, or then touching your eyes, you're going to spread that virus. And the flu, the COVID-19, and the RSV are spread by people many times when they are just beginning to get symptoms and or very mild symptoms. Um, and then they're considered asymptomatic, but they can still spread the virus. Complications are fairly frequent with these viruses and or often are immunocompromised patients, which is why we want to emphasize getting vaccines to those patients. So bacterial infections, pneumonia, sepsis, which is bloodborne infections, uh, respiratory failure where patients might need to be admitted, might need to be on a ventilator. Neuromuscular complications. We see that a lot in muscle weakness and fatigue, having trouble taking deep breaths. Lung complications where they get fluid buildup um, in the lung capacity is very limited. We see cardiac complications, which is very common with the COVID because it affects the heart muscle to quite an extensive degree. And of course, we worry about being hospitalized or death in these patients when they become more severely infected. Next slide. Um, I think I covered that one, so we can go on to the next one. Um, So what is a flu shot? So a flu shot is something that enables the body to make antibodies, and that's the same with the RSV vaccine and the COVID vaccine. Your body sees the particle of the virus, then makes an antibody to it, which will then hopefully build up immunity in that person, and it's often variable. Some people make very high levels of immunity, some people less effective immunity. For our 2023-2024 influenza, this vaccine covers four virus strains. So two are influenza A, which is the H1N1 and H3N2, and the other two are B strains, which is the Victoria and the Yamagata lineage. So those are the ones that experts, CDC, and so forth, have tried to predict are going to be the most common um, viruses that are exposed um, potentially exposed for our patients. Next slide. So we recommend flu vaccines to almost anybody over the age of six months, um, and especially for what we call essential workers, which are people who are in long-term nursing care, our hospitals, our pharmacy staff, our outpatient clinics, our inpatient hospitalization, especially like our ER, and even like people who are assisting our volunteers, they are very susceptible to being exposed to patients coming in. There are patients who are at increased risks of COVID-19, and that's our over 65-year-old, especially those who reside in skilled nursing facilities or congregate living facilities, and individuals, again, who are immunocompromised, whether that's from a racial ethnic minority, which we do see more in certain populations, more susceptible uh, genetically, um, and also because of certain underlying medical conditions, again, such asthma and diabetes. Persons at high risk for influenza complications, again, include some infants and younger children, especially children with neurologic complications that can't take good respiratory, you know, cough or deep breathe. Women who are pregnant, again, because of the respiratory compromise, because of the the, the fetus pushing on the diaphragm. And again, our adults 65 and older, just because of their age, 
compromises their immune system. And there are other patients with underlying medical conditions, such as dialysis patients, cancer patients, asthma patients, who are going to be much more susceptible. There are a couple of categories of patients who should not be receiving uh, the vaccine, and those are ones who have experienced um, had what they call Guillain-Barre, which is a very severe neuromuscular disorder, and also patients who have had allergic reactions. Many times because the original vaccines were made with egg byproducts, people who are allergic to eggs then were felt to be susceptible. But the more recent vaccines don't use that process. So even people with egg allergies are safe to take the current influenza, RSV, and COVID vaccines. Next page. So at Washington Hospital, what we're doing for our influenza response planning, we are screening and accessing as many eligible inpatients as possible. We have mandatory vaccine or proof of vaccine for all of our healthcare workers. So our staff, our volunteers, our physicians, all of our staff are required to do this. We also emphasize preventative measures such as hand hygiene and universal mask protection, eye protection, when they're going to be exposed to someone who has infections. CDC recommends universal masking under certain circumstances when there's high-risk settings or facility that's exposing COVID-19 outbreaks. We do regular evaluation and analysis of results. We look at our annual analysis of employee vaccination rates, which I'm pleased to say is probably one of the highest that we've in all of Alameda County. Uh, quarterly evaluation of patient vaccine rates during flu season, and we also monitor very closely influenza-like illnesses or any respiratory illnesses in our emergency department and probably uh, selectively isolate those away from patients who are coming in for other, EDL, other reasons such as trauma or something else. Next slide. So people wanna know how does the flu vaccine work? Um, so the flu vaccines are, again, are not 100%. They're about 40 to 60%. We've just seen the new um, data coming out, and I'd say it's probably about the same. But anything that's protective in someone who's going to be more susceptible is certainly worth investment into the vaccine. And a lot of us like work in the hospital and don't know exactly when we're going to be coming in contact with somebody who might be infected. So the more protection we have, the better it's going to be. Unfortunately, the vaccine changes for year to year, so we do need new um, influenza vaccines every year, and they're designed to protect the major virus strains because those virus strains do vary from year to year. When to get the vaccine, CDC recommends that it be started in September, October. And there are some uh, outreach clinics that we've been doing, um, such as the Nakamura Clinic and the Danielson Clinic and the um, Washington West to provide this either drive through or walk up. And we're, I'll talk about that in a few minutes because um, nobody knows exactly when we're going to see these viruses begin to surge. So the more protection we can get and the more um, shots earlier in the fall help build our immunity because it takes about easily two weeks once you've gotten a shot to start to see immunity in there. Uh, next slide. Uh, sorry. Yes. So can the vaccine give you flu? Answer is no, it doesn't give you flu. Can it give you flu-like symptoms? Yes, because of the antigens and the immunity that your system is beginning to build up. You might have low-grade fever, you might have soreness in the arm, and there's flu-like symptoms. So flu shots are made in two ways, inactivated virus, which is a virus that's not infectious, or what we call recombinant, which is basically taking the DNA part of the virus. And those are probably the most flexible and most easily um, able to manufacture and keep updated. So people want to know, is it safe to get COVID-19 and a flu shot all at once? So the answer is yes, you can do it. Um, it's perfectly fine. It's no data that you're going to receive any less side effects or more side effects and, or any less effectiveness. If somebody has potential for spacing apart, they might want to take advantage of that. But if this is your one chance to get to the vaccine clinic, take both vaccines. Um, sometimes we even do the RSVP, RSV at the same time. And again, people may experience a little bit of some soreness or some flu-like symptoms when they're getting these vaccines, and that's because your immune system is beginning to take 
advantage of the antibodies and begin to make um, protective immunity to that. So we think those unfortunately are uncomfortable symptoms, but very positive symptoms. Very, very rarely will these symptoms last more than a few days. So I'm sure most employers and are willing to let somebody who's had a vaccine take a day off if they're experiencing symptoms. And generally those symptoms are a whole lot less severe than if you actually had the infection. Um, next slide. So RSV is mostly in, in children, but we're beginning to see it more in adults. Um, most of the times they're fairly mild uh, symptoms and people may just sort of blush it off as an upper respiratory infection. Occasionally it can be more severe and, and necessitate, necessitate hospitalization. As of September of 2023, there are two single dose RSV vaccines that have been approved and both of those are available most at the pharmacies. And the vaccines currently are recommended for adults 60 years and older, um, infants and pregnant women in the third trimester because they're more, it's more susceptible. But also, it's also recommended for patients who have immunocompromising illness, such as diabetes, uh, COPD, asthma, HIV patients, cancer patients, chemo patients, any of those are also, they have to be the vaccine when the physician's putting the order in, it needs to be coded specifically not to look as a routine, which would be your 60 and above, but to indicate why that person needs those vaccines. Next slide. So the question is for what is a COVID variant? Because we've been seeing a lot of changes over time, different strains of COVID. So the COVID variants are monitored in our US uh, labs, mostly through the CDC. And there are different categories. So one is called a variant of interest. So those have the lower levels that have been associated with some infections or vaccinations, don't seem to transmit virus as readily, uh, maybe have a little bit of a diagnostic impact or maybe increased transmissibility. So a virus, a variant of concern is one that has an increased transmissibility, so much more contagious than the other level and potentially can cause more severe disease, such as requiring hospitalization or even sometimes death. Variant of high consequence are ones that are much more severe. They have um, reduced effectiveness of treatment and potentially other complications. Just lost my screen. Hold on one sec. Okay, um, and these are ones that are worth monitoring even after uh, persons have been recovered because sometimes we see sustained um, virus levels even after recovery. Next slide. So in California, at the end of August of 2023, we had about 73% of people who had their primary vaccine and 21% who had up to date on the boosters. In Alameda County, we've been doing much better. We have about 83% who've had primary vaccines and 34% who are up to date on the boosters. And on the bottom left, you can see the very high, high surges of deaths and the very far um, uh, left ones, those are the, the years of the 2020 and 2021. And you can see over time, we're seeing much less severe illness and much less death. And I think part of it is the change in the virus. I think the vaccines, I think people being more aware and more conservative with going out and using masks. You can also see the race ethnicity, which is what I wanted to point out. So unfortunately, Pacific Islanders do seem to be much more susceptible to this infection than, say, other um, races and ethnicities. Next slide. So this talks about the COVID vaccine update. So Moderna, Pfizer, and Novavax have created new versions aimed at covering the Omicron variant. So the XBB is the shorthand for this Omicron variant. Uh, so we were seeing some that are a little bit different early on, and then this is most likely the most current um, variant that we're going to be seeing going forward for this year. Uh, the, the Food and Drug Administration has vetted, obviously, the new uh, vaccine booster. They're much stronger, much more uh, adapted to this variant and will most likely cover what they are predicting are 
the variants that are to come. So this vaccine virus is very updated and just recently released. So you can see it says September 12th, they, they met the dead, deadline. So this was approved by CDC and the FDA yesterday. We're anticipating it's going to take probably two to three weeks before we actually see it in our pharmacies and available. Uh, so we hope, hope, hope we're going to get it by late September, but to be determined. The J&J and the Janssen vaccine is expired and no longer available for use in the United States. So it's the Moderna, the Pfizer, and the Novavax. Next slide. So this is where I'm very, very proud of our team. And I think the community should be rest very assured that we have up-to-date coverage on all of our bases. Um, we see a COVID primary a vaccine, a 97%. This includes our staff, our doctors, our all of our workers throughout the hospital, and those that have gotten primary plus booster, 94%. We are just now starting our flu blitz. We make it available to all of the shifts and try to make it uh, user friendly. We have mobile cards that go to the units and the wards to try to make it very available. Um, we are doing, like I said, the drive through and the walk up for the community as well. So we are really pushing access and availability for this um, flu like season. Next slide. So what are we doing for COVID prevention? So we've implemented a number of measures. We are doing self-screening um, when uh, people come in and coworkers to try to minimize any um, exposure when they're arriving to the facility. We do immediate isolation of any patients who are symptomatic, whether it's people who are coming in for surgery, people who are coming in for the lab, people who are coming in for uh, the ER. Right now, our surgeries require mandatory COVID testing if patients are symptomatic or immunocompromised, and those patients, regardless of symptoms, will also require mandatory uh, COVID screening. We may right now make masking optional for our patients or visitors that are not performing in clinical procedures. So the Alameda County and California State is in the process of updating their regulations. We expect to make some mild uh, updates and changes in configuration based on what they come up with. So we think that going forward, it will be like in patient care rooms, such as the ICU, um, respiratory care, the oncology units, um, transfusions, dialysis units. We're most likely going to need masking for those areas, but it's yet to be determined by uh, Alameda County and California. We do think it's very important because those patients are very high risk and obviously very, very vulnerable to anything. And like I said, many people are having COVID and asymptomatic and don't even realize that they have it. So again, we probably will start masking for those high risk areas, but we haven't mandated it as yet. Next slide. So prevention and control, what are we doing? Hand washing, hand washing, and more hand washing. So we really, really emphasize that. Um, you'll see a lot of our infection team going around making observations when people are doing uh, patient care and doing a little nudge when they see them not washing or being as compliant as we would like. So it's all just in a matter of making sure we are providing best care for our patients and for our coworkers. Um, so we also do cough etiquette where we want people if they're coughing, put their hand in front of their face for coughing and also hand hygiene, wash, wash and wash some more. Um, we're doing physical distancing with separation of at least six um, feet between patients. And it's amazing from when I first started seeing the crowded rooms that we have and now boasting to people we have single occupancy, which has helped our transmission so much. And I mean, it's a huge step that administration took, and it's just been so outstanding to see that support for our patients and our community. We also see a lot of times increased frequency of decontamination, environmental cleaning, both from their staff and also from our nurses and uh, clinical staff doing more cleaning. We're maintaining more consistent supply of personal protective equipment. And I have to say a huge shout out when we first started COVID to the team and especially led by Kimberly, how much and Ed, how much effort went into making sure our staff, our visitors had personal protective 
equipment. I mean, it was amazing to see the outreach that they were doing to make sure that we had protection. So we're also following national standards for healthcare worker safety. Next slide. Okay, take home message. What are you going to do? Please, please get your COVID booster when it comes out in the next two, two weeks. Please, please get your flu shot every year. This virus changes and so does the vaccine. And if the RSV is recommended by your healthcare provider, we strongly encourage you to get that as well. Practice good hand hygiene. Wash your hands as much as you can. Carry the little vials of the Purell or disinfectant in your pocket and do um, personal hand hygiene, such as coughing um, and masking if you're required. Uh, social distancing is important. Wear a mask if required. If you do get sick, please don't delay care. There's so much of flu, RSV, and COVID out there that if you're getting respiratory illnesses, please, please, please do home testing. Please, please contact your healthcare provider. The next slide, where can you get the COVID vaccine since I've pushed it so hard? COVID testing and vaccines are available at Howler's, and it says every day, but not Sundays. Um, vaccines are available on a walk-in basis, but we encourage you to make an appointment just because I think there's going to be a surge to it. And we also want to make sure that we have adequate staff and vaccine supplies. Flu vaccine through the Washington Township Foundation is in multiple locations at their clinics, and they have flu shot hours. We encourage you to make an appointment if possible, just so we have an idea when you're coming and make sure that we have stuff available and staffing available. Respiratory syncytial vaccine right now is currently available through most of the, of the um, pharmacies such as CVS and Walgreens. So with that, I will take questions. Thank you for letting me present. This is also a huge favorite topic of mine to make sure that we educate our community and our staff, and you'll find tremendous support at Washington Hospital for all of our community on many, many fronts as well as this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin. Are there questions from the board? Yeah, Diane, this is Bill. Do you have any, uh, have you heard about any insurance issues with coverage for the RSV vaccine? Yes. If definitely, if you meet the categories of the 60 and over, then you definitely qualify. But again, if when the physician is putting in the order to note if the person is diabetic, has asthma, other COPD type things, so not just check off standard immunization coding, put in the code specific to the patient, it will go through and it will get covered. All right, thank you. Dr. Martin, uh, we heard a very sobering announcement tonight about <laughs> your retiring from clinical practice. Uh, I'm sure there are many, many patients in the Tri-City area that are, uh, you've treated over many years, and people are extremely grateful for the wonderful care and yeah. concern that you've given. And well, I can truly say Washington Hospital has been a fabulous place to work. I mean, the support that we get, especially for me, for the infection control program from administration, nursing takes on a lot of um, uh, responsibilities and the other doctors too have done that. So, I mean, it's been just a tremendous place to work. So, I've been very happy, pleased professionally and clinically to be part of this team. Thank you very much for your service. It's uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're ready now for our finance report, uh, Tom. Okay. I'll sign out, but if you have questions, just send me emails, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again. Julie, did you want to see that or do you want July? Why don't you pick? Okay. Um, so I'm happy to present the July uh, 23 for the first month of fiscal 24. Uh, <clears throat> Entering fiscal 24, we were pretty optimistic. As you know, we put some strategic initiatives in there. We um, had some small increases to volume, and um, we were going uh, and we're working on improving our staffing, flexing to the volume that we have. So July has historically been kind of an average month. On a trailing 12 months, we averaged about 157.5 days. Um, we had 152.3, which was off budget um, by 7.3. Some of the things that uh, came in. Um, on this were um, reduced volume, 
the payer mix was weak, and we'll get to that part. Um, we had a large increase in uh, self-pay, private pay. So normally we run about 1.4. Uh, July was 2.3. Mm. Um, and then uh, we had some opportunities around charge capture in a couple of departments. So um, continuing on then, combined average daily census, 163.7 uh, on a budget of 168.2, so off about four and a half. Discharges were 848 on a budget of 943. Patient days were down 226 at 4722. Observation uh, was elevated in the month of July to 352 on a budget of 266. Our average length of stay uh, was higher than budgeted at, at 5.46 and the budget at 5.25. Moving on to the next slide for operating indicators. Uh, case mix index at 1.558 essentially on a budget of 1.6. So a slightly off there. Deliveries, uh, 33 uh, off the budget. So and as you know, we can't predict delivery. Um, <laughs> Also, 108 on a budget of 141. Surgical cases were 460 uh, on a budget of 455 for a positive of five. Um, I will point out that part of that is due, and you'll see on the next slide, to um, endoscopies now being called out uh, in the surgical area. And the average reimbursement on a trailing 12 month for endoscopy is 12,000. And the average reimbursement, or excuse me, charges on the um, uh, neuro is 176. Mm -hmm. So filling that up with takes a whole lot of mm -hmm. endoscopies to make up for what we're um, short there. Uh, and then cath lab cases, we were off by 32. So pretty consistent with prior months, if you will. Uh, we did have a new um, physician start in August, and Kimberly will talk about August in a moment. And then outpatient visits at 78.59 were off by about 529. We had a budget of 83.88. And then emergency visits were 48.83 on a budget of 5200, so about 350. So um, pretty consistent with what we've seen at, in the uh, ED. But moving forward to the surgical and cath lab indicators, so as I mentioned, 460 uh, in total on a budget of 455, and you can see the neuro was off by 12. And the uh, other surgical cases, which average charges are around 50,000, were also off at, at uh, by seven at 154 versus 161. That said, the re joint replacements exceeded budget by six. Uh, cardiac met budget at 12. And as I mentioned, endoscopy um, outperformed by 18 uh, in the period. In the cath lab cases, uh, 149 versus a budget of 181. Um, and we were off across the board with the exception of neuro uh, intervention radiology, uh, where we were one uh, to the positive. On productivity, uh, we were one, uh, excuse me, 1401 on a budget of 1444, so we were under budget, 43 FTEs on the productive side. Uh, Non-productive, we exceeded budget uh, by 26.7 at 237.9 versus a budget of 211. So when we add those together, a total FTEs at 1639 versus a budget of 1655 or under at 16.4. When we look at this on a flex basis, however, um, we should have been at 16.25 and not 16.39. So we're off by about 14 FTEs when we flex. Um, given uh, the importance of achieving um, our productivity measures and the, the impact on our operational budget, um, Kimberly has asked that uh, finance work with the VPs and, and the budget owners to develop, in certain areas, um, operational improvement plans, and then bring those back to her within the next couple of weeks. Um, we are focused on productivity. Okay. 
Summary of total deduction. <laughs> Excuse me. Contractual allowance. Um, again, contractual allowance was under budget um, at 144 versus 152. But when we compare that to the uh, gross revenue of 190 uh, versus 202, we actually look at the, the ratio and we have a positive ratio. Unfortunately, 75% of our gross revenue was driven from government and self pay private pay. Um, and that impacts our overall um, net revenue. So when you go down to the bottom, we're talking total deduction as a percent of revenue at 77.98 or almost 78% on a, a budget of 76.95. Okay, moving on to the GASB summary. Again, we talked about gross revenue and the total deduction. So net operating revenue was 43 million on a budget of 48. Total operating expenses were 46.2 on a budget of 48.2, so we're off by about $2 million. Leaving a net operating income uh, negative of 3.2 on a budget of negative 53,000. So net operating margin was negative 7.4 in the month of July. Net operating income was 702,000 on a budget of 125. So our net income it finished uh, the month at two million five hundred thousand on a budget of seventy two to the negative on a budget of positive seventy two. So our net income margin is negative five point two. Um, one of the things we're um, looking at is it's great that we came in under budget because of the volume, but if you look at the percent decrease in the gross revenue of five point nine and salaries and the other expenses only coming in 4%, there should be a tighter ratio to that, so we are looking at that as well. Okay, now we're gonna look at it from a FASB standpoint. Um, as you know, GASB applies to governments and uses modified accrual accounting, which is a combination of accrual and cash. Government entities typically use the modified accrual basis as it only recognizes revenue when it's available to spend and expenses when they are due. FASB, uh, which is used by nonprofit, non governmental agencies, public and private companies, uh, uses full accrual accounting. So the numbers are going to be a little different. Um, so we look at it and go uh, net operating income is now 3.7 as opposed to the 3.2 that GASB said it was. So our net operating in margin is negative 8.6. And when we get down to the uh, non-operating income loss or gain, we have a gain of 420 as opposed to the 700 that we saw on the GASB. So our net income is uh, negative 3.3 on a budget of negative 3, and our margin is negative 7.6. Uh, the next slide covers our GASB EBITDA. And as you remember, we took the T away because we don't pay taxes. Um, and I'll draw your attention to the middle of the box. And our EBITDA margin is flat. It is zero uh, on a budget of uh, 3.1 million. And with that, I'll stop there. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. We recognize it's a challenge. It's a challenging one. I think, as, as Tom mentioned at the beginning, I think when we look back at last year's, where our our revenue was aligned with last year's, mm -hmm. but we had built, we have built in, and we're it's taking us some time to ramp that up. We know we have um, some initiatives and some you know areas that we've got to focus on. Our payer mix did help hurt us, uh, and also we know we've got to reduce our expenses too. Mm -hmm. But um, you will see that um, Cath Lab for the first time is, is is swinging back, but we still have work to do on that, of course. So I'm going to present August that they are um, still very preliminary because we're still following up. We we have had some uh, charge capture challenges that we are working on in terms of some areas and some late charges that have been coming in. So um, that we felt we needed we needed to get July solidified and we've got preliminary in terms of August, but these we're still working on with the finance team and some of the areas um, 
the August number. So I will uh, dive into these uh, with the uh, gross revenue. So gross revenue of 195.2 million for August was unfavorable to budget by 10.6 million or 5.2 percent, and was unfavorable when compared to August of 2022 by 787 thousand or 0.4 percent. Uh, inpatient gross revenue of 111.4 uh, million was unfavorable to budget by 14.4 million uh, or 11.4 percent and 1.5 million or 1.3 percent unfavorable to August of 2022. Outpatient gross revenue of 83.8 million was favorable compared to budget by 3.7 or 4.7 percent and 0.8 percent better than August of 2022. Moving on to the key uh, statistics, uh, average length of stay of 5.47 was higher than budget uh, of 5.10 uh, by 0.37 or 7.3 percent and was lower than the August of 2022 length of stay of 5.94 or 7.9 percent. Uh, In August, there were 13 adult discharges with length of stay uh, greater than 30 days, ranging from 31 to 71. Excluding these outliers, uh, average length of stay was 4.99. Still in-house, we do have three patients with length of stay over 30 days, uh, 33, 46, and 48 days. Uh, observa uh, outpatient observation equivalent days came in at 382. That was unfavorable to budget by 263, by about 119 equivalent days, and greater than August of 2022 by uh, 65 equivalent days, or 20.5%. Inpatient average daily census uh, of 146 was unfavorable to budget of 161.3 or 9.5 percent and lower than August to, um, average daily census of 146.9, so just slightly under August. The combined average daily census uh, 158.3 was unfavorable to budget of 169.8 by 6.8 percent but 0.8% higher than August of 2022 average daily census. Uh, moving on to discharges, uh, you can see the discharges of 877 were unfavorable to budget of 981 by 10.6%. Uh, August 2023 discharges were 0.3% more than August of 2022. Uh, unfavorable variance in discharges driven by uh, both surgical and medical Patients, um, surgical discharges were 31 fewer than budget, and medical discharges were 73 uh, fewer than budget. <coughs> there are patient day trends. Uh, patient days of 4,525 were unfavorable to budget by 5,001 by 476 days, or 9.5%. Uh, patient days were 28 days, or 0.6 below August of 2022. Um, IMC days uh, were uh, about 20% uh, under budget, and ICU days were 15.7%. Uh, looking at our surgical trend, our total surgeries in August of 475 were consistent with the budget. Uh, surgery, surgeries were 49, 9.4% uh, uh, below August of 2022. Uh, inpatient surgeries at 215 were favorable to budget by 7 or 3.4%. Uh, but 5.7 percent below um, August of 2022. Outpatient surgeries at 260 were unfavorable to budget by 7 and 36 below 20, uh, August of 2022. Now looking at the breakdown, um, you can see that joint replacement cases were unfavorable to budget by 17, uh, that which is 10.4 percent and were 16 percent less than August of 2022. Basically, that was due to Dr. Saw being out on vacation, and I will say you'll see in September all of those. I mean, he's he's been he's been very busy since. Uh, neurosurgical cases were consistent with budget, um, and were one uh, more than August of 2022. Our we did see lower cardiac surgery cases; they were unfavorable to budget by four, and were three fewer than August of 2022. Endoscopy uh, cases were favorable to budget um, by 19, but were 14 fewer than August of 2022. And lastly, all other surgery uh, cases combined were favorable to budget by two, but were five um, fewer than uh, August of 2022. 
our cath lab trend for the first time in one year or mm -hmm. more it was uh, basically um, pretty much at budget uh, that came in at, uh, for August at 193, which was one favorable to budget of 192, and uh, were consistent uh, with uh, August of 2022. So cath lab inpatient cases at 99 <coughs> were 8.3 percent unfavorable to budget of 108. Uh, and three fewer than August of 2022. Cath lab inpatient cases at 94 were 10 or 11.9 percent favorable to budget of 84, and three 3.3 uh, 3 percent more than August of 2022. So as mentioned uh, by Tom, Dr. Doshi, our new I, um, interventional radiology physician, uh, did start in uh, on August 14th. Started in the middle, and we do have a vascular surgeon that uh, will be coming in in October. Mm -hmm. Looking at the cath lab activity, you can see that cardiac cases were favorable to budget by two and were 9% uh, more than August of 2022. Our non-vascular interventional radiology cases were favorable uh, to budget by eight and were 12 more than August of 2022. Uh, peripheral vascular cases um, were unfavorable to budget by seven and uh, 20 fewer than August of 2022. And lastly, neuro IR uh, cases were unfavorable to budget, were below budget by two, and were consistent with August of 2022. Uh, looking at deliveries, uh, we did see our deliveries go up. Uh, we came in at 134, but it was lower than the budget uh, by five, but three more than August of 2022. Also, C-sections were 35.8% of our total deliveries, which were unfavorable to budget um, of 33.8 percent of total. Our non-ER um, outpatient trend, uh, our non-emergency outpatient visits of 8,959 were favorable to budget by 359 4.2 percent, but were 3.3 percent per, 3 uh, below August of 2022. We did see uh, diagnostic imaging that was 16.4. Uh, percent favorable to budget. Um, respiratory therapy visits were 95.3 percent favorable. This was offset by our lab that was 10.5 percent unfavorable to budget um, in, in terms of our non-ER uh, outpatient trend. And a lot, I will say, um, the lab visits um, we still had in the budget were still that we would be doing some pre-COVID testing before, or before surgical, before surgeries or procedures. And so, uh, that that is really the driver for being below budget. So. Uh, now our emergency room visit trends. Um, our visits were uh, came in at 4,997. They were unfavorable to budget by 3.9 percent, but as you can see, they were 5 percent more than the prior year. So we did increase that budget in terms of our emergency room visits. Um, so we've seen it continue to increase over the last year, but it is uh, lower than, than what we uh, did budget. Moving on to our gross revenue recap, um, surgical cases were right on budget. Uh, endoscopy, endoscopy cases, which we, uh, as Tom said, had a lower revenue per case. Uh, we had more cases than budgeted. Uh, lower joint replacement cases were unfavorable to budget, which, as we know, has <coughs> higher revenue per case. As a result, the revenue was unfavorable to budget by 5.3% or $2 million. Room and board revenue was unfavorable to budget by 8% or 3.1, and patient, due to patient days being 9.5% lower than budget. Deliveries were unfavorable to budget by 3.6%, and revenue was below budget by 1.9%. Emergency visits were unfavorable to budget by 3.9%, but we had a, a higher number of visits that were of higher acuity, which resulted in revenue being above budget by 2.3%. Our cath lab uh, cases were favorable to budget by 0.5%, and revenue was 1.3% higher than budget. And lastly, ancillary services revenue was unfavorable to budget by 5.9%, driven by basically by the lower inpatient uh, activity. Moving on to our preliminary payer mix, uh, you can see for August that our government-sponsored patient revenue made up 71.3% of total gross revenue, 
this is lower than the budget of 72%, uh, but higher than the prior year's percentage of 70.8. Uh, HMO was 2.7% of gross revenue, which was higher than the budget of 2.3%. Our PPO was 23.8% of gross revenue, which was lower than the budget of 24.3%, uh, and also uh, quite a bit lower than the prior year's percentage of 26%. Again, uh, as Tom noted in July, our private pay was higher uh, than budgeted at 2.2% of gross revenue, uh, which is higher than the budget of 1.4% and higher than the prior year's percentage of 1.4% of gross revenue. Uh, just so um, to be aware, there was a total of 1.5 million in charges from out-of-the-country out of patients. In August, there were four accounts with charges exceeding 1,000, 100,000, and one of those accounts had charges uh, totally close to 400,000. Uh, looking at our productive uh, FTEs, our productive FTEs were favorable to budget by 23.4 or 1.6 percent at 1,436.7. Our non-productive FTEs were unfavorable to budget by 17.6 or 9.5 percent at 203.3 FTEs. Total FTEs uh, of 1,640 were favorable to budget by 5.8 or 0.4%. Uh, our productive FTEs for adjusted occupied bed of uh, 5.49 were favorable to the budget of 5.53. As you can see, however, our total FTEs for adjusted occupied bed of 6.27 were unfavorable to the budget of 6.24 by 0 0.03. So as as mentioned, we do need to focus on our, our labor and productivity. Moving on to our Whitmouth Clinic uh, statistics. Um, Whitmouth Clinics were uh, below budget in August by 8.9% uh, um, and lower than August of 2022. Uh, most of this was basically in, in terms of uh, open positions that we had that uh, came to be filled either later in the month or will be filled. Uh, in pediatrics, for example, we have a physician that is out on leave. We subsequently have brought in a nurse practitioner, uh, and we have a new pediatrician that will be starting at the beginning of 2024. Uh, there were also positions at Warm Springs and Masonic that were anticipated to be filled in August that will be filled uh, later in the month, in, in the, the beginning of August, and were filled later on in the month. Um, so, as I said, a lot of it was just in terms of uh, positions, um, and we had some unanticipated time off in order to meet it. So, DEPCO outpatient visits of 1,996 were unfavorable to budget by 18.9% uh, for August. Uh, you can see the, a, a great deal of it was driven by a, a Washington Outpatient Rehab Center. Unfortunately, we did have an open position. We had somebody leave to be closer to home. Uh, we are in the process of um, getting that filled, and we have somebody that will be filling it, and we have, we're have we still recruiting, too, for additional. So, unfortunately, the rehab center has been, as you can see, when, when we have a full complement of, of staff, we're above budget. When we lose somebody, so we're continuing to work on on, um, on that in terms of, uh, of getting uh, people in here in terms of staffing. WASC was below budget by... Um, 3.4%. You can see Peninsula Surgery Center was was below budget, but by, just by two, and Arlone College was above budget. Um, and also, we had a very busy uh, month for the Radiation Oncology Center. Uh, and lastly, in terms of our key financial statistics, uh, days cash on hand for August ended at 130. It was a, a day, uh, four days in terms of decrease from the prior month. Basically, we've had a lot of um, higher operating cash disbursements, uh, uh, which included that, which made up those four days. We had insurance, pre annual insurance premiums and capital expenditures that um, basically had, we also are working on, we had a lot of expenses in terms of projects like the bridge and other projects that we need to get reimbursed through our general obligation bonds for. So we have some of that too. I will say the good pieces, uh, I will say our days and accounts receivable came in at 56.9. Uh, that's uh, the best we've done in the last 12 months uh, from that perspective. So, so that is very good in, in terms of um, uh, bringing in the, the dollars. And our, for charity care, we came in at about 195000 uh in charity care adjustments uh, compared to the last month. So. 
So again, we do have a lot of work we know that we need to do. We've got uh, some follow-up to do, so um, we understand we've that we've got that to do. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Thank you. Really? All right. We're ready for the hospital uh, for the uh, calendar. All right. So I'm going to just start with employee of the month. It's uh, Benny Serpax, good by Benny, and she came to the U.S. from uh, Portugal when she was 15 years old, uh, not speaking much English. Um, I do just want to, I should have said she's uh, from our account, she's a patient account representative from our patient financial services. I want to make sure we recognize that in terms of uh, uh, Benny. Uh, she quickly became bilingual and graduated from a local high school. She married and had two sons and one stepdaughter. She's also a grandmother to two darling little boys. Uh, then he joined Washington in July of 2008 as a per diem employee. She quickly was moved over to the cashier's office to help out. After being successful in that department, she was given the opportunity to relocate to the patient accounting department as a full-time employee. Uh, when the office was reorganized, she took on training of the all staff with her billing expertise and patience. She has a great deal of experience when dealing with complicated patient accounts. The department looks forward to Vinny's laughter and joy that she brings to their office. She is loving and caring and always there for all of us and ready to jump in. The staff has stated that we are a stronger department because of Vinny. And so I'm very excited for her to be September uh, Employee of the Month for September of 2023. Yeah. All right. Moving on to the uh, calendar of events, I know Kayla had gone over a lot of the ones we've done in the past, um, but want to just go through. These are the ones uh, you can see that happened in August. When, as mentioned, we've had a, a great show in for our Fremont uh, Summer Concert Series, and at the last one in, on August 10th, we did 128 blood pressure screenings. Uh, you can see we also um, did a, one on August 14th, Nutrition on for Healthy Aging at Acacia Creek, and did 45 uh, residents attended that. We've talked a lot about our Welcome Teacher Day. We had over 1,200 families mm -hmm. that came by to pick up a, a flower for their teacher. Um, also, just mentioning a couple of the other ones, um, we, did, we did attend the Festival of Globe Community Fair hosted by the Federation of Indo-Americans. Um, and Christy Caracappa has been busy helping out and giving information out on, on Medicare, what you need to know. And she did that in a, a couple weeks there, you can see. Uh, finishing off in terms of uh, moving on to the next slide, you can see in terms of, um, again, we've uh, spent some time uh, with uh, the Niles Canyon Post-Acute training, um, training their staff on caring for post-surgical spine patients. Um, Dr. Seema Sagal, I will say, has been out and, and doing a, a number of community events. She was most recently at Niles Rotary, and I will say she was very well received and, and really spoke about an important subject in terms of navigating depression and anxiety. Uh, also, just wanted to mention Elisa Curry um, has been out uh, talking about fall prevention and recovery at Acacia Creek. Moving on, you can just see some of the, the uh, pictures from Concert in the Park. Uh, and all the work that we've done with that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nutrition for Healthy Aging at Acacia Creek. Uh, you can see those pictures. Then Welcome uh, Teacher Day on August 15th. A lot of fun seeing all the, the children. Then moving on to our Rotary uh, Niles Rotary Club and Dr. Seema Sagal presenting on August 31st. Next, uh, Polly's Step Out on September 6th, and that was one of the events that Kayla had talked about, too. And then uh, Acacia Creek's presentation on fall prevention and recovery by Elisa. We have a number of upcoming. You can see all of those. Again, we continue to do both Facebook Live um, and YouTube, and we do some of them also in person. But these, uh, as you can see, are, are going to be on Facebook Live and YouTube. We have our new uh, GI physician, Dr. Inman, uh, who's going to be speaking on heartburn, uh, when heartburn is acid reflux. Uh, we're going to be at the Newark Police Station. 
Also, uh, September 17th, as uh, 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 Kayla said, we will be at uh, doing participating in Newark Community Days, too. You can see the other one. Moving on to the next slide, just uh, being able to see these. Um, anybody, we will be have these up and can see if anyone would like to. We also have them in our catalog, as, as Kayla talked about. Um, Again, uh, Dr. Inman is going to be presenting um, on dysphagia and reflux disease. We'll be at the Disability Resource Fair on September 24th. Um, October 3rd, Dr. Eftemia, our hematology oncologist, is going to be talking about genetic testing for breast cancer and uh, breast cancer risk, or testing for breast cancer risk. Moving on to October, uh, the beginning of October, we have a number of events that's happening on October 7th uh, throughout the community, so we'll be busy on those days. Then October 10th, lastly, uh, we do have our employee health fair uh, for the city of Fremont that we'll be participating in the downtown event center. And then lastly, I just want to uh, let it, remind everybody that we do have the 37th annual Top Hot Gala coming up on October 14th. We're very excited. Um, it is going to be benefiting our new UCSF Washington Cancer Center, and really it's going to be returned to the traditions of the past, and we're very excited. Uh, we're going to have that outside cocktail reception, a three-course meal, uh, a live flamenco dinner show, and much more. At this point, I've been told we've sold about 60% of our tickets. So, yes. So if you haven't bought your ticket, I highly recommend you do so. Yeah. <laughs> So, thank you very much. Thank you. It's a wonderful event. Yes. I'm looking forward. To it. Right. Good. Well, this evening we have no action items. Right. Uh, do we have any announcements? We do not. We do not have any announcements. So, I'm sorry. Uh, do you want to talk about the 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 bond? Yeah. Why don't you give an update? That's fine. I was just asking. No, and, you uh, could just let them, then let yeah. them, go ahead. So the reception was very warm. When we went through the capital markets, we were t almost 21 times oversubscribed in our offering. Um, we were able to not only tighten interest rates, but coupons, uh, which is pretty unheard of <laughs> during the period. Um, and so we actually received on the revenue side $40.5 million for the premium. And then on the GO side, our, our net proceeds are $127,321,000 on 125 offers, so it was a very strong yeah. reception by the market. So. Tom, we appreciate your good news here. Yes, that was good news. Yeah. Thank you, Tom, for ending on that note. Thank you very, very yes. much. Okay. There being no further business, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for your attendance. Yes.